So good morning, everybody. My name is Murray, one of the pastors here at Grace, and just uh, thankful to even have all the kids here. So who here is under 10? Just that many? Okay, some of you just raised your hand, but I couldn't hear your hand raising, so I just want to hear you. How many here is under 10? That's better. Good. So what you need to let your parents know is that any time that I ask a question, you're free to answer it out loud, right? And I hope you will answer it out loud, and that will help teach your parents that they should be doing that too, right, to respond, because this whole time is supposed to be for us to respond together around the truth of what God reveals about himself that's good news to us in his word, and it's way better if we can respond and praise him to together. And so... Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18. You can turn there now. So Matthew chapter 18, the first book of the New Testament. And so we've been kind of in a little series, kind of looking at the dark side of Christmas. I mean, you know you're looking a little bit at the dark side of Christmas when you start a series in the book of Job, right? And then we have moved on, but to, to realize that, that even the joys of Christmas, depending on what you put, where you're finding your joy, it has an expiry date. But Jesus doesn't. And Christmas really is often, it's thought of as just really the best time of the year. Right? How many of you kids think so? Nobody thinks Christmas is a good time? Cancel it next year then. Should we cancel it? So you think Christmas is one of the best times of the year? Okay, that's what we need to hear so we know what's going on out there. Yet, even though Christmas right, as wonderful as it's meant to be, really all that getting together with, with, with people can lead to some issues that results in the need of forgiveness. Both forgiveness that's to be given as well as received, and good news, the truth about Jesus reminds us that Christmas is forgiving. You caught that play on words? Okay. In fact, the need for forgiveness is so great that Jesus says that those who don't forgive others won't experience and receive the forgiveness of God. Everywhere in the Bible, there is this correlation between God's forgiveness of you and you forgiving others. So it's a far bigger deal than just having um, a peaceful Christmas gathering. So we see Christ, or really forgiveness is just demonstrated all throughout the Bible. In Genesis, we see it in Joseph. He refuses to get repentance, uh, vengeance really, and then he ends up forgiving his brothers to be reconciled with them. David, he's a king who uses his, his power and he commits adultery and then murder to cover it up. He needed much forgiveness. And God promises to forgive him in a future offspring, born through his line. And in response to that forgiveness from God, David writes us in a psalm, he declares, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And later after this, we actually see David forgive a man who cursed him and threw rocks at him and dirt. And, and David's soldiers wanted to avenge David for for this insult, but David actually stops them and forgives Shemi, that's the guy's name, and it's clear to see then that one who is forgiven much has the freedom to extend forgiveness to others. And in the promise of the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, God says of his new people, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So just forgiveness, it's just a theme throughout the whole scripture, and it's what Christmas is actually all about. And it's the reason that Jesus came uh, as he did, that we might be forgiven. And isn't it wonderful to receive complete forgiveness? And isn't it wonderful when we get the opportunity to extend forgiveness to someone else who totally does not deserve it? Okay, why, why the difference, right? Why so quiet? Why this inconsistency, right? I think we need to get some help in our hypocrisy from Jesus. So let's start reading in Matthew 18, verse 21. 
Matthew 18, verse 21 says, Then Peter came up and said to him, that's to Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times, or literally 70 times seven. Because the Jewish rabbis in that day, they taught that you were to forgive someone up to three times. So Peter here is thinking he is really being generous when he says seven times. He's expecting Jesus now to come give him a pat on the back, right? Um, bring him up to the front of the class and just praise him. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Why can't the rest of you be more like Peter, right? But is that what Jesus says to him? No. Jesus ramps up the forgiveness. He says, Peter, I see your seven, and I raise it 70 times. In other words, Jesus is making the point, you don't ever not forgive. If you start counting and checking off, right, 73, 74, 75 times, right, just waiting to finally reach the limit, then you've missed the point of what Jesus is actually saying. Jesus is not after a number, right? He's not simply aiming at a quantity, but actually he's trying to introduce us to a quality of forgiveness, a whole new way of looking at things. Right, So he's, he's talking about a whole new wineskin that's not driven by checklists. It's not keeping a record of wrongs. Jesus wants their hearts and he wants ours really to line up with his heart, with hearts that are ready to forgive as God forgives. And to make sure that Peter and then the other disciples and us Right? Don't miss it. He then tells a parable. And in this parable, he's going to literally give us 10,000 reasons to forgive. So read with me verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. So this servant has a 10,000 talent debt. Since the average laborer made about a talent a year, that would be about a half a billion dollars, right, in today's figures. And if we take inflation into account, really, it'd be about a trillion dollars. And 10,000 is the largest Hebrew number. So Jesus is really driving home the point that this guy's debt is enormous and it's unpayable. And it's not like the king lent him this much money, not like he lent him this amount, because this servant is not the cook, right? He was a steward that was given oversight and the privilege and the responsibility of great proportions, perhaps called to manage an entire region or province in the kingdom. But he threw either mismanagement or corruption, maybe both, he sunk the kingdom into a state of ruin. And this enormous amount would put the king's very kingship in jeopardy. Because back then, there wasn't public money. The king he used his own money and wealth, really. Um, that went out to the provinces then to pay for uh, roads, for the military. And so to lose this amount would mean the king would not have the ability to pay his army, and it could crumble his kingdom. So verse 25, let's continue. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So this would mean that for all of his life, for all the life of his kids and any kids they had, they would never be able to pay this off. And thus it would mean slavery. It means no future hope, generation after generation after generation and generation and so on. Sound familiar? It's supposed to. Right? Verse 26, so the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Now I do want you to notice there's no being sorry for what he's done. There's no apology here, right? He's not taking any ownership of anything wrong, right? Any mismanagement. It's just don't give me justice. I'll pay you back as long as you don't give me justice, Right? Now, this is ridiculous as a person, really, who hearing of the sin debt that we owe to God saying, okay, I'll start going to church. I'll start doing some good works, right? This is an unpayable debt. 
have patience with me. It's literally the term for long-suffering. When you suffer, you don't necessarily always have a choice in the matter, right? It just happens to you, right? Anyone can suffer. But to be long-suffering, that's when you make a deliberate choice to bear, to endure up under the pain. It's actually voluntary suffering for a greater good. Suffering is passive, but long-suffering is active. And it comes from a place of freedom. You have to have freedom in order to be long-suffering. Verse 27, and out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. And the case of God towards us, which is what Jesus is getting at, he not only brings our account to zero, but then he fills our account to overflowing. From unpayable debt to unimaginable riches. So let's talk about then how we can actually develop the freedom of a forgiving spirit. The ability to be long-suffering, to endure mistreatment from others without making us bitter, without it controlling us. In Hebrews 12, because God knows what we're like, he gives us this warning. He says, take care lest you harbor a root of bitterness, and by this many are defiled. You know, when you cut down a plant, right, you can think you've maybe ended things with that plant or weed, whatever it happens to be, but if the root is still there beneath the surface, it can rise up again. So why does God picture bitterness really in us as a root? Well, I think because bitterness can be festering there under the surface, right? Yet, I think way too often we can be totally unaware that it's even there or how it's actually affecting us. But in Hebrews, remember, he said, many are defiled by this. Many have to deal with this issue of underlying roots of bitterness. So that means most of us in this room are affected by bitterness and we may not even be aware of it. We may not even really grasp how much it is impacting us. Because every day there's these irritations, there's hurts, and they affect you. And they will bury roots of bitterness in your heart. And you won't be free unless you have a forgiving spirit. And we can never just turn to God and start justifying our lack of forgiveness, right? With, but God, you don't understand what they've done, right? And you don't understand how they've hurt me, right? The cost to me Personally, to forgive them is just too much, and they're so undeserving, right? And who's to say they won't hurt me again? You know, what they did is inexcusable. Like, they know better. And our hurts can pass into us. They can make us cynical. They can harden us. They can fill us with this inward self-pity. And all sorts of prejudices begin to come about as a result. Now look what happens back in Matthew 18, verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he, went, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, that's about a hundred bucks, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. Now we notice this guy's not after justice. He might tell himself he's after justice, but how do we know that he's actually all self-focused? He starts choking the guy, right? He's choking this guy in anger. Here we see this forgiven servant acting like a king. And remember, Jesus tells parables, which is acting to us like a mirror. Verse 29 so his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him. We've heard this plead before in this parable. He says, have patience with me and I will pay you. It's the exact same response that, he, that the first servant had made to the king. Verse 30, he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. So this servant who is granted forgiveness by the king does not in turn become a forgiving person. And it's unthinkable because this whole parable is meant to have us think there's no way. 
Like, that would never happen. That, that just can't be. That'd be such a contradiction. Verse 31, he says, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. And then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. That's just wrath. That is justice. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Jesus is saying an unforgiving heart leads to the justice of eternal punishment. Because it's a proud creature indeed who won't forgive. Especially when we see and experience the pardoning nature of God himself. And God reflects himself in this parable. At the end of the parable, the king says, since you have not forgiven, it really shows that you've not really recognized the depth of your own sin. And it shows you've not actually repented or any change of mind regarding the wrong that you've actually done to me. And this is why, right, you've not appreciated the mercy that I've actually extended to you, the king says. Because of this, you will be jailed and punished. You will pay your own debt and bear the suffering and pain yourself for your wrong. So let's consider three observations I want to from verse 27 as we gaze upon the forgiving spirit of the king. The first thing we see there is the king canceled the debt. He forgave the sinner of the debt there, the end of verse 27, which means you do not get revenge. You do not make the other person pay the cost. You absorb it yourself, and that includes the emotional debt of pain that comes from being hurt and sinned against. Now, this is not saying you let everything go and you never make legal action or other action, but when someone wrongs you, it actually creates this emotional debt of pain and a sense that this other person owes you and it has to be paid down. And most people make the other person pay. And there's all sorts of ways that we can make the other person pay, right? You can insult them, right? Talk behind their back, make snide remarks, right? You can be cold to them. You can withdraw your friendship from them. You can never speak to them, or you can gossip about them, or maybe uh, slander them to other people, or you can just despise them in your heart, right? Play little movies in your head, right, where they get theirs, right? And if we're honest, when something happens to them, we feel a little better because it actually serves them right. And that starts to pay the emotional pain down. Seeing them get theirs... Enough times, slowly I can start to feel less like they owe me. But what happens is making them pay actually changes you. Because the evil then gets into you. The evil starts molding you and bitterness actually starts to enslave you. Actually starts to drive who you are. Tim Keller tells of a guy who's... his. Kids wanted to come to the VBS that the church was, was holding, and they wanted to be part of that, but the dad said, no way, I'm not letting my kids go to church because my dad shoved his religion down my throat and forced me to go. And so he knew his dad would just love to see his grandkids go to the church, and so in refusing to let his kids participate, it was really all about getting back at his dad, right? Right? He was making his dad pay. In reality, we see his dad was still controlling him, right? Because he's not asking, what's best for my kids? He's not asking any of the questions. He's just under the control of his bitterness towards his father. He thinks he's beating his father. He's making his dad pay, right? He's hurting him because he knows his dad won't like this. So what's happened is, though, he's become bitter and cynical and hard. He's actually in bondage to his bitterness against his dad. 
Or, so you can make that other person pay. And then you'll be controlled by bitterness, by vengeance, or this is going to take humility. You can pay it down yourself. Absorbing, bearing the pain yourself. And that's what the king did in this parable. So what do we mean by pay it down? Well, every time you want to rehash the past, but you don't, it hurts. Every time you want to rub their nose in it, but you don't, it hurts. Every time you want to be cold to them, but you're warm to them, that hurts. Every time you have a chance to run them down to someone else and you don't, every time you see them prospering and you refuse to stick little pins in them in your imagination and you don't, right, you absorb the hurt. Why? Because it's costly not to take revenge right? Because you're making the payments yourself. If you make them pay, you'll reduce your emotional pain, but you'll be twisted and warped, and it will impact you and not in a good way. You actually become more like the bully you despise. You've just returned evil for evil. But if you refuse to bring the matter up to other people, you refuse to tear them down with little barbs, right? You refuse to stick the little pins in them in your mind. If you refuse to take revenge of any sort in spite of the the fact it hurts. But then slowly, because you're not putting fuel on your anger, you're not putting fuel and, and fertilizer on the bitterness, that anger and bitterness will start to be rooted out. It depends on the size of the wrong, right? It might only take a few minutes. Maybe it'll take days. Maybe it'll take months, even years. But when you absorb the debt pain and you choose to bear it, it goes down. And as it goes away, you're actually free. The evil hasn't molded you. It hasn't controlled you. It hasn't worked itself into you and planted roots there. You're a free woman or man, or child, because you have forgiven. Your mother, or your father, your brother, or sister, your spouse, your boss, that other person, right? You've actually overcome with love. So the first thing you have to have to have a forgiving spirit is you have to refuse to get revenge. And that revenge can take all those different, different ways. And then you have to choose to pay the debt of pain down yourself. Secondly, we see that this king had pity on him at the very beginning of verse 27. And literally, it's a, it's a word that means to identify with them. And this is extremely interesting. It's really important. Whenever someone wrongs you, typically in your heart, you're going to stress the differences between you and that person. But if you want to have a forgiving spirit in your mind, you actually have to make a conscious decision to actually stress what's common between you and that other person, not the differences. So when someone wrongs you, the first thing you typically do is you focus on their worst failure. You focus specifically on what they've done. And it's kind of like a cartoonist who who makes this caricature of someone, right? You take just one element, right? The nose, you make this big bulbous nose. They've got a little bit big ears. So you make big, big ears and the character you you draw whatever it is, you exaggerate it. And when a person wrongs you, you can actually reduce them to what they did to you. They lie. They're a liar. They betray you. You just see them as this unforgivable betrayer. But when you lie, of course, it's a little different, right? Because you're complex, right? And there are mitigating circumstances. And there is so much good in you because you're three-dimensional, right? You're complex, But not them. They're one-dimensional, right? They're a cartoon caricature. And here's why. Because deep inside every human soul, we have this, this deep desire to justify ourselves. Deep down, we're afraid we're not okay. We don't feel valuable. We don't feel worthy. And so we have this insecurity, and it creates this need in us to justify ourselves. And that's why people justify themselves by saying, 
I would never have done that. I would never have done something like that. Why? Because your pride needs to feel better, superior, noble. You need to self-justify. So you say, I'm not like that. Yeah, I have some problems, but I would never do that. But if you don't want to be twisted by bitterness, you need to think of the commonalities, right? I'm a weak person, and they are weak, right? I do stupid things as they do. Maybe not the same stupid things, but stupid things nonetheless. I am fallible like they are. I have wrong thinking at times. I'm not always purely motivated at times. Because if you refuse to think of the other person as in common with you, then you will not get your freedom. And when you don't forgive, you're excluding yourself from the company of sinners that God says we are. And that is pride. That's the sin of the devil. So first, don't take revenge. Pay the debt of sin down yourself. Secondly, identify with the person, the common things instead of the differences, or you will exaggerate their offense. And then you're free to do the third thing. The third thing, he released him. He released him. He forgave the debt, right? He did not seek revenge. He released him. Why? You go, but what about justice? Like, why would he let him go? Because isn't this one of the things we actually struggle with? In seeking to forgive someone else who has wronged us, or maybe they've wronged somebody we love and care about, and we can feel like if we forgive them, then we're excusing what they did. We're saying we're okay with it when what they did was not okay. In fact, it was evil. Well, in Jesus' story, when the guy set free by the king meets another servant who just owes him a small amount, he doesn't just say, you need to pay me. Remember what he did? He choked him. He just lets loose and chokes this guy because he's not truly after justice. He is bitter, he is angry, and he is self-consumed. He's all consumed with how it's affecting him. He's all consumed with his own self, kingdom of self. Right? He's concerned with his comfort. And how this impacts him. But we don't see the king lose it on this guy. He doesn't come in bitterness, starts choking the guy. No, the king, his anger, rightly so, but it's controlled. And he gives him justice. Because he just can't let this unrepentant guy go around and continue to hurt people. He can't just let this guy go hurting others. Now many say... I don't want to forgive, I want justice. But you never pit those two things against each other. If you don't first personally forgive, then it won't be justice that you're actually after. If you hold bitterness in your heart, you might convince yourself that you're after justice, but the truth is you actually just want to make them pay. You want them to hurt Right? So it can pay your emotional debt down. It's actually all about you. So if you haven't dealt with bitterness, then you'll never pursue justice. Forgiveness actually provides the path through which justice can now be pursued. Well, now you know all about forgiveness. So get out there and do it. How? How are we going to do this? Right? The king, now he has compassion on this guy in the story. The guy who almost brought his kingdom down. And when you realize this enormous debt, right, you just go, ah, that doesn't happen in the real world. This is just a make-believe story. There's no king like that. Or is there? There is one king. The king took pity on him. And the word pity here is the key helps us understand it. It's the word that's mostly translated in the Bible like the word compassion. And that's the Greek word that's used of Jesus over and over again in the New Testament scriptures. 
So here we have Jesus' word, compassion, used of this king in the story. The servant here, he's acting like a king. He's demanding his money, right? He chokes his fellow servant. He's acting like he's the judge, like this is his kingdom, and he has no right. And yet, that's what we're like when we stay bitter and angry and vengeful at someone else. We are servants acting as if we're the king, as if we're the judge. And Jesus is showing us in a mirror what we're like if we hold on to self-centered anger and if we fail to have a forgiving spirit. So what's the answer? What's the solution? Well, we have to behold the king who became a servant. The ultimate king looked down on us knowing that we would cost him his glory, all that he had in heaven. He came to earth to sacrifice himself to die on a cross he cried on that cross, tetelestai, which means it is finished, it's paid in full. You have to put your little story into the big story. You have to look at what Jesus did for you. There was a debt, and sin has ruined this world. And it seeks to bring down God's kingdom, and it is devastating. And that includes your sin and mine. And Jesus didn't take a penny from you. He didn't make you pay one bit. In mercy, he paid it. He paid it. He bore the cost. He absorbed the pain, though we betrayed him. And you'll never be able to pay what other people have done for you unless you see your guilt and him paying the infinite debt for you. You have to put your story into the bigger story. And after all he has done for you, aren't you almost glad for an opportunity to thank him by magnifying him and reflecting his image by bearing the cost for another undeserving servant? And then you can show how much Jesus really means to you. By forgiving another servant a small debt and restoring the kingdom of heaven here on earth. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, he says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, think about that, there's identity. He has chosen us to bring us to himself, holy, set apart, right, and dearly loved. That's who we are because of Jesus. Then he says this, clothe yourselves with compassion. Put this on. Wear this around and enact that throughout your day. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Long-suffering. All words that describe Jesus. Put on Jesus. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And you have to notice the order. It's because we are already dearly loved and forgiven completely that we can forgive. It's not do this and then God will love you and forgive you. That's the difference between religion and the gospel of Jesus. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 31 and 32 says similar, just from the, the other side of the coin. He says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Malice is when you wish harm or hurt upon another person. Just, he says, just throw it all at the foot of the cross, where the great debt of your bitterness and anger and self-centeredness and wrongs were all paid for in blood. And he says, be kind and compassionate to one another, the Jesus word. Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So because you're so completely and utterly loved, you can endure and have patience. When you're so humbled by God's grace, then you realize you have no right to be angry. And when you are so affirmed by God's grace, then you don't have the need to be angry. 
We stop being a servant, acting like a king by looking at the beauty of the ultimate king who came to earth and became a servant and paid everything for sinners like me and like you, and then you'll be free. Because I just don't know any other way to be free in a broken world like ours. A world of abuse, a world of hurt every day. But men like Joseph and David can read of them. They could forgive because they were a people who themselves knew they needed forgiveness and who had a debt they could never pay that was paid by this king who is God in human flesh come to substitute himself for us to take the wrath and the punishment and the hell upon himself so that God could both be just and forgive us completely. He absorbed the cost. He paid the debt. He came to me when I was still in my sin, totally unrepentant for what I had done. And yet when I was his enemy, Christ died for me. It was his forgiveness and grace that actually brought me to repentance. So as we think about gifts this Christmas, here's a great gift. Forgiveness. Do you know the root of forgive is give? That's because it is a gift. It's not earned and it's not deserved. And my prayer is that you would receive this costly gift, God's forgiveness in Jesus, and then you might pass on this precious gift. This is a gift you're supposed to re-gift. And pass it on to others because you have been forgiven so much. So getting back to Peter's question, how many times should we forgive? It's just not about the math, right? It's about the mercy. It's about having a merciful heart that just keeps flowing out forgiveness, distributing it, that gift as it's needed. There's just no limit to how many times we should forgive because there's just no limit to the forgiveness and mercy that God has, has bestowed on us. And when I do not forgive then typically I've exaggerated their offense against me and in my mind I've diminished my offense against God. So may the cross which has purchased our forgiveness empower us to be a people who forgive from the heart and we can just leave justice in the hands of our king. Refusing to forgive is just inconceivable to one who knows Jesus. Our forgiving others actually enables us then to move closer to the one who came in ultimate humility. Born in a manger for the purpose of going to a cross to forgive us and to reconcile us to God. Where Jesus pays down the debt and the pain of how we have hurt him and how we've wronged him. So Christmas should really be a humbling time. And a time that sets us free to actually be forgiving from our hearts. As God's people already dearly loved, we can do this not in order to be loved, not in order to be forgiven, but because we are utterly and completely forgiven and loved. Let's pray. Lord, your grace to us should truly humble us. As we ponder you and how you have treated us, how you've responded to our wrongs and our hurts against you. We think about the truth of Christmas where you, the Lord of glory, you left everything that you had in heaven, all the joys, all the comforts, all the glory to be laid in a feeding trough and ultimately nailed to a cross for us. Lord, Help the truth of your mercy towards us. Set us free from our self-exaltation and cause it, Lord, to humble us truly, to be really thankful, to be joyful. Would you just help us to put our story into the story from Matthew 18 so that we would stop being servants acting like kings by looking at the beauty of the ultimate king who became a servant and paid everything for us who released us from our great debt. Your forgiveness to us, is, it's a costly gift that we do not in any way deserve. I just want to thank you for your incredible grace, your long suffering towards us that has set us free to forgive 
even as you have forgiven us. It's the name of our precious Savior, Jesus, I pray. Amen.